Vasiri and uh, welcome to the latest session on the Festival of Bharat series of contemporary issues. Today's question, uh, we're going to be visiting the concept of tolerance and intolerance, but setting it against the perspective of the post-2014 elections and the new Narendra Modiji era. So the question that this uh, illustrious panel will be looking at is, is India genuinely a tolerant country, or is it showing signs of increasing intolerance, as we are told very frequently by multiple sources? Is India becoming more regressive under Prime Minister Modiji's custodianship? Or, in fact, are we moving forward in leaps and bounds, but perhaps what uh, some people call breaking for, uh, India forces? Are they becoming even more vociferous as they become perhaps threatened? So, by uh, introduction, I'm sure that everybody here is known to you, but um, we will start this conversation with uh, Fonsaji, who has just spoken so eloquently in his keynote on tolerance. Could you perhaps share seven minutes on the subject of tolerance, but particularly with regard to the allegations raised against Narendra Modiji's custody? All right, if my microphone is working, yeah, it is working. <coughs> Yeah, I, I know Mr. Modi when he was uh, Chief Minister of Gujarat. <coughs> we, uh, I, had, I had an exhibition on, uh, on the Kashmiri Pandits and um, another exhibition on Aurangzeb. You know, Aurangzeb was a very meticulous emperor. And uh, whatever order he passed, you know, they were written down in Parsi and the emperor seal was you know, opposed. So most of the orders of uh, Aurangzeb are kept in two archives, the Bikaner archive and the Hyderabad archives. They are accessible to everybody. Our historian was able to access, you know, the Bikaner archive. So we, we got many orders of Aurangzeb. What I said was not only a very medical example, but lived very old. He lived till 80, which was for that age, for that time, it was a very ripe old age. Oh. So we use this, uh, this firma and these edicts of Aurangzeb to mount an exhibition. I have a foundation called FACT, Foundation Against Continuing Terrorism. And FACT was started because I saw the exodus of the Kashmiri Pandits. I saw the Kashmiri Hindus being chased of their ancestral homes and lands, you know, for no faults except being Hindu. So at that time I thought I should do something for these Kashmiri Pandits. So when when I had some money, I got a prize of journalism. I started a foundation called FACT, Foundation Against Continuing Terrorism. And the first exhibition was on the Kashmiri Pandits, and the second was on Aurangzeb. Now, Aurangzeb is a very touchy subject in India because he's supposed to have been tolerant, whereas actually he was a very intolerant man, and uh, not only towards Hindus, but towards his own family, he behaved his brother, that I should go for apostasy. He uh, imprisoned his father, and it is said that he slowly poisoned his father, Shah Jahan, Shah Jahan, the famous builder of the Taj Mahal. And uh, he imprisoned his son, and he wrote his will. No, he was a he was a he was a, a he was a good guy in some ways. So he wrote his will by hand. Aurangzeb he wrote his will by hand, and in his will he said two things. I want to tell you. First, I should have never left. Shivaji Maharaj escaped from Agra, and second, never trust your sons. So Anagdev, before dying, said, you should never trust your sons. So anyway, we showed that exhibition in Delhi, in Habitat Center. You know, people said, oh, why rake the past? You know, it's all past, forget about it. So, so, but it went okay. Then we showed it in Chennai, and in Chennai, there's a gentleman called the, the Nawab of Arcot, who, whose ancestors were named by Aurangzeb. He has no power, but in the hierarchy of Tamil Nadu, he's third. After the governor, the chief minister, the Nawab of Arcot. So he came to see the exhibition, and in that exhibition, there was a painting on the raising of Somnath Temple. You know, Somnath Temple was raised, you know, at least seven times. One time by Aurangzeb. We had the order of Aurangzeb next to the painting to show that, you know, it was not an invention. So anyway, this gentleman got very angry, and then the next day, some people, there was a mosque near the exhibition hall. Some people came, they started shouting, you know, in India, shouting slogans. And uh, the police came, 
uh, that Nabab of our court knew Mr. Stalin, who was then the son of the then chief minister, Mr. Karun Anidi. So he called Mr. Stalin, and Mr. Stalin sent one of his best officers, the one who had caught the, the sandalwood smuggler, Virapan. Yeah? So that, that very high ranking came, came down and closed the exhibition and took the ladies. There were two old ladies guarding the exhibition took them to jail, the police took down, they threw some of the paintings, they threw that painting of, of some night on the ground, broke it. So I was in Delhi, I flew down, you know, and I got these daily, these ladies released, and I alerted the press, and then, you know, even the Hindu published something, and Mr. Modi happened to read this article about the Aurangzeb exhibition being closed down in Chennai. Oh, it took us six months. It took me six months to get back the exhibition from the police. Uh, six months, the police kept that exhibition. Anyway, I got it back, repaired it. Now it's in the Shivaji Maharaj Museum, Pune. Uh, so to, to go back to Mr. Modi, because I'm going away from Mr. Modi, uh, I met him, so he called me in uh, Ahmedabad, I met him, and I found him to be a very, very nice person. Soft-spoken and hard-working, you know. I, I found that in Gujarat, because I interacted with some ministers in Gujarat then, that Mr. Modi had implemented a, a rule of working. You know, most ministers in India, if you go, <laughs> even today, if you go to their places, it's full of people who come for favors, you know. The Congress create, created a culture of favoritism, you know. I come to power with your black money, then and, you know, after that I do favor. You come and I do favor, and in turn you'll do favor to me. So Mr. Modi, his ministers, you know, they are, and some of these ministers, BGP2, they are like that, no? They put plastic chairs, they don't receive in their, you know, in their fancy chamber. They receive in one public office. They put three, four, five rows of chairs, you know, and people move up the chairs and come with their problems or they're working or you know or, or you know working problems you know and there is one secretary next to the minister he takes notes next one so it takes four or five minutes this is remarkable in india huh? so i was very impressed by mr modi and uh, i felt it was after the gujarat riot though and i felt that uh, here's a man who uh, makes people work and works himself very hard. In his office, there was no hangers on, you know, there was, and it was high tech also, there was a digital screen, I had brought a presentation on my museum, you know, he saw everything, you know, I was very impressed. But I never thought he would become prime minister. Because, you know, of course, there was that Gujarat rights, you know, stigma on him, so I didn't think he would become prime minister. So he did become prime minister, and today he's the prime minister of all Indians, and he's proved that, he wants to be the prime minister of all India. I feel, you know, as a defender of Indians and Hindus, I feel he goes overboard, you know, inviting people like Amir Khan, who may be a you know, good actor, but uh, I said, you know, that he feels that insecure in India, that he may leave India. You know, every time there is uh, some attack on church, he goes out of his way to convince Christians that, you know, they've always been free to practice their religion in India, and they continue to be free to be practiced. You know, every time a Dalit, you know, commits suicide, he says, it breaks my, it breaks my heart for his mother. So he really shows that he's a min prime minister of all Indians. And yet, no, I don't think any prime minister, except maybe Mr. Trump, <laughs> has been so much slandered and attacked and, you know, vilified, oh, both no. in the Indian media and Western media. Uh, one more minute, Francois. One more minute, Thank okay. You. So, you know, I gave a long talk about, you know, the myth of intolerance in India. So the myth of intolerance of Mr. Modi is also a total myth because the man is, a, you know, has been a, practically a brahmacharya all his life, you know, he's, a, he's devoted his life to a cause, you know, that the cause of uh, the Hindu spirituality, you know, he became a political leader by, because he was asked and had a, RSS member, he felt that, you know, he should obey. So he became prime minister by accident. And, and I, I feel he's a, you know, he's a wonderful person and he should have the support of all Indians, whether they're Hindus or Muslims or Christian. Everybody should unite to make India, to give India the status that India deserves, that of a world superpower, you know, on par with China. We see that China um. is doing so good, but India, because of so many things, one of them is the creation of intolerance is not doing as well as China. Okay. Francois, thank you very much for that. Um, wonderful. Um, 
You mentioned the incident with this Aurangzeb uh, exhibition. I'd not heard of that before. It's, it's quite, a, quite a shock and an eye-opener for me. I'm reminded that tolerance and intolerance, a gauge for them, is the freedom of speech yes, and so the freedom of that expression. We showed there, but it was, you know, there was Indeed. no discussion. But still, <laughs> the intolerance was expressed. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Um, freedom of expression requires access to the channels of communication and the channels uh, with uh, media, for example. In recent years, we've seen those channels perhaps constrained to some degree, so much so that uh, a counter-argument has had difficulty being articulated. Um, on that note, I'd like to turn to Vigasji, who I think has risen to the challenge of finding and creating alternative channels. So would you like to talk about the subject, but with the emphasis being on perhaps freedom of speech under Narendra Modiji's and your experience of encountering obstacles to it? Okay. Uh, so I've been lucky to meet Mr. Modi personally many times before uh, 2014 especially. So I had, uh, even after meeting him and, uh, and talking to people who have been close to him, we have to understand few things about him. He, people refer to him like a Gujarati mindset, like a businessman and things like that. But you have to understand that he has been a pracharak. RSS pracharaks are like, not get swayed by a lot of emotional things. They have obviously separated from their family, so those things are connection. They are focused on the job. This is how Mr. Modi ji is very focused on his job and it's uh, very, I mean, it's pay because I'm his fan, there are lakhs of fans, uh, his fans, we get very much disturbed by the media narrative created around him, against him ever since 2002. But we have to understand that that guy is pained by those allegations, but it doesn't sway him or it doesn't, he doesn't get disturbed by those allegations at all. He's focused on his work. Coming to the narrative which is being created against him, you have to, uh, uh, there are many people who follow him and he follows uh, them back. And I've heard a lot of stories and I have personally experienced myself that if I have to communicate a few things to him, we just DM him. For example, I remember there was a temple being made uh, in Gujarat on his name. I DM'd him saying that, so see this uh, temple is being made uh, and it is causing a lot of media negative things about me. I don't know whether it's, it was because of my tweet or uh, my DM to him, but the next day the temple was demolished. So it is, and many people ha have given him ideas about his speech, you are going to this particular place, why don't you speak on this topic, this is a very emotional topic. Many people communicate with him uh, through his website called narendmodi.in and seek for the appointment. When he was CM, and I'm told and I know that, when it was him, anybody who used to uh, ask for his appointment, he used to personally go through all the appointment lists. That whether I should give this uh, man appointment or not. And he used to meet a lot of people uh, I know who had brilliant ideas to share with them. And he was actually taking a lot of ideas. That's why he made that Gujarat model. Gujar Gujarat model, he acknowledges, and he, uh, we should also know that he has acknowledged many places that it is not something which is out of his own idea. It was actually creation of a lot of good ideas around the country and he adopted in and uh, implemented those ideas. And But the problem is that this left narrative is so strong and I'm very frustrated. Though I've got uh, created a lot of pages because of frustration and anger and in order to unite Hindu cause and they have got around 2 crore to 3 crore likes. But I feel that their their uh, reach is immense and their branding is immense and I personally felt that during the Katua incidents, uh, for uh, when it actually started coming out, everybody around me was very much sad by it. Even I was shocked because I didn't know the truth. The truth uh, they portrayed that obviously we all know that they said that a, a Muslim girl was raped and uh, murdered inside a temple. She was kept for seven days inside a temple. The pujari of the temple called his son to do the dirty work from Meerut and things like that. It was a very horrible story which was portrayed. Many of us uh, spent a fish, uh, I also remember Shefali ji also raised a few points, but we were immediately uh, uh, means labeled as a pro-rapist uh, uh, and uh, that kind of allegations were made against us. Even BJP was uh, not willing to touch that particular subject because left narrative was so strong. You remember everybody, the second, second day, uh, the, uh, the, the news broke, the second day everybody, most of the heroines were uh, holding play cards with the same statement written on it. 
hundreds and hundreds of uh, editorials were written especially in the branded newspapers uh, like uh, uh, washington and post and uh, new york times and people around us especially uh, uh, outside of india used to believe that this particular thing actually happened even we believe that this might have happened inside a temple done by a pujari to humiliate muslim population but after looking into the charge sheet we found that it is actually a fa false story even now we were not able to uh, convince most of our own followers that it is a false story so it is a very frustrating thing that what narendra modi is fighting and what hindu cause is fighting is a very powerful left narrative and a network system which we may not be able to break at least not like this we have to unite and we have to understand that we have to support each other uh, gurumeher kaur for example what was her achievement i do, uh, she spoke against india and then she was invited to lot of news talks books were written she was uh, uh, made a youth icon for what why was she made a youth icon what did she, did she do rather than then taking uh, using her father's name a uh, a uh, uh, hero of india saying that nobody killed pakistani didn't kill the war killed him and actually playing the hands of left narrative this is this is a actual uh, achievement she used her uh, uh, her father's name and whole left liberal lobby was uh, uh, promoting her through different channels she is now a panel she is on every next panel discussion she is getting awards after awards we have to work really hard and together all the intellectuals of uh, right wing have to actually sit together uh, all the kamyodhas have to sit together and work out a plan otherwise uh, we should not depend everything uh, on narendra modi if narendra modi is someone who has i think he is the first a uh, nationalist in 800 years who has come with such a force yeah atal ji was there but he, his government was not in such a majority and uh, he is a very powerful leader and we have to make his uh, hand strong while uniting and understanding that not everything should depend upon him and we should all uh, unite for example such initiative you have taken this is very wonderful which is very very wonderful and such things should happen all around india and everybody of us should support each other so uh, and not get depressed that if some hindu did something because of hindu cause we should not defend him at the same time we should not ashamed be felt ashamed of what he did we belong to a culture which is much bigger than uh, a small incidents like that and we should be proud and we should highlight that and learn about it that's all uh, that's all i have to say vikasji thank you for that thank you very much uh, it's reminded me of an incident in the kumbh mela uh, a few years ago where i was visiting the kumbh with my son and it was that year when we had the unfortunate incident of a bridge collapsing mm -hmm. so i'm in um prayag as we call it and i got a phone call from the bbc mm -hmm. saying um we'd like you to talk to us a little bit about the collapse of this bridge and should india be allowed to have such events if it can't handle the safety of its attendants So this was the BBC troubling to call me all the way in India to talk about this issue. And so I mentioned to them that uh, thousands of years ago our ancestors issued an invitation to the whole world saying come and join us at this particular place so that we can revel and bathe in each other's discoveries. And every time the Kumbh is held a city magically appears with 24 um, police stations located and half a dozen hospitals and then it all disappears. So the day that London can do the same is the day that you can call and want to talk about something which has happened unfortunate though it may be but it's part of this rhetoric of the bandwidth being consumed by very very powerful dialogues uh, it strikes me that um the extreme left and the extreme right are probably children of the same parentage and the same ancestry equally irrational and equally energetic to fill the bandwidth the issue we've had in London with freedom of speech you probably know that narendra ji narendra modi ji was um, prevented from visiting uh, many european countries and his visa was not going to be permitted etc and that was a, an, an initiative driven by the left uh, on the extreme side of british politics but now that's transformed and people have begun to see that there is actually much more than the froth that the um, the, the airwaves seem to have been generating and he was fated when he arrived in the british parliament and we all noted very interestingly that the only person who boycotted 
the address that um, our Prime Minister gave was actually the leader of the left-wing opposition party who, who was not able to attend that event. But freedom of speech is something that I think is a, a real good benchmark for tolerance and intolerance. So on the, the subject of freedom of speech, which I translate into the freedom to risk offending somebody, if you can't take the risk of expressing because you have fear that somebody might take offence, then that's the first sign, I feel, of an intolerance creeping in. Now, um, Dr. Sofiedi, you too have um, created quite a few ripples out there. Um, and so, in terms of freedom of, of, of expression and what you have experienced when you've tried to express your thoughts, feelings, hopes and aspirations, would you like to perhaps have seven minutes also to yeah. share those ideas and thoughts? Yes, absolutely. So, as um, Pandiji said, that the first sign of intolerance is when freedom of expression is withdrawn. On the contrary, as you can see in our country, it is a freedom of expression which has been propagating this, you know, propaganda of uh, intolerance. So all these people, if they are being given the chance to speak so much against the country, against the prime minister, and such uh, with such accusations and in such abusive manners, uh, I mean, me, Chef Ali Vediaji, we have all <laughs> suffered a lot of abuses over social media. So. This itself is a sign that there is there is no really true intolerance. If at all if at all, uh, if at all there is an intolerance, it is towards us who are saying that there is no intolerance. So <laughs> it's very uh, it's a paradox here if you if you mean what uh, if you understand what I'm trying to say. So no, there is no intolerance. And one very good example I would just tell you when you you just shut down your TV, you just don't pick up the newspaper, don't go through social media. Just normal routine life and you go out. Where is intolerance? Uh, <laughs> I'm a Muslim. Most of my patients, 90% of them are Hindu. My name is Dr. Sophia, the name itself. There has been, I have not faced that. My husband, his name is Iqbal, Iqbal Hussain Thakar. And he is an aerospace engineer and he goes to all the um, I mean, er, in his earlier job, he used to go to all the government organizations. Never even once, he's right here, you can check with him. He <laughs> never had any problem with security clearance. And this is, you're talking about ISRO, you're talking about uh, GRT, you know, you're talking about all this uh, organization, Indian organizations, which are high security. So at ground level, we, as Muslims, we have not faced any intolerance. And you should all ask that question. So just use common sense. Just don't fall for some people taking a placard and writing whatever the uh, whatever they feel like. You know, just don't fall for it. Don't let it play on your mind. You ask questions to yourself. When I'm going shopping, does anybody deny me based on my attire or based on my appearance as whatever religious background I belong to, or do I deny someone who comes to me? No. We are a country that it, tolerance is inherent to India. The very philosophy of Sanatan Dharma is based on tolerance. Uh, Francois G has already elaborated so much, I wouldn't want to go over it. But then, you know, uh, tolerance is ingrained in our Indian DNA, irrespective of whichever religion you belong to. Especially it is ingrained in, in Hindu DNA, you know. And I know this is going to offend a lot of people, but irrespective of whether you're a Muslim, Christian, or whatever, we all have Hindu DNA. And this is what makes India a secular, tolerant, inherently tolerant country. This is what we talk about unity and diversity. This is our ancestral DNA. This we have been carrying with us since, ever since, you know. So this myth really needs to be busted and people from all walks of life need to come forward and, and talk, talk about their experiences. So instead of adding fuel to the fire on social media, or instead of fighting, you know, let's talk about your experiences and let's propagate more of peace and harmony. And uh, if I may, a few things I would like to say about PM Modi. So I personally, I was a kid, you know, when uh, the Gujarat riot happens and uh, I, w I got carried away and I hated him for a long time that this man, because of him, so many Muslims died and whatever. 
then I started observing, I started communicating with people and then I realized my eyes opened up that there's so much of uh, propaganda by the media and they are demonizing him. And when I started understanding from Muslims in Gujarat, they have come forward and told the uh, um, amazing uh, development that has happened in Gujarat. And after that, you see, Gujarat has been very peaceful after that first rights. If a man was truly intolerant and if he was a dictator, let us ask ourselves, would people vote him again and again for three consecutive terms, two consecutive terms? No, right? So that itself is a, is a big, uh, you know, um, he does not have to say anything much. His work and the very fact that people brought him back, including the Muslims, is a, is a testimonial that he is a truly tolerant man and um, he's done great work in Gujarat and that's why we brought him back uh, f to lead the nation as a whole and um, we need to give him a chance. We, we, need to give, we have given him a chance and we need to give him a chance further also. And I see tremendous growth happening in the last four years despite all the chaos and all those things, muck so much being thrown at him repeatedly. No prime minister has received so much of flack like him. It's really sad. For what? For bringing yoga forward? Uh, I mean, really? <laughs> <laughs> It's things like this, you know, for bringing yoga, for being a, uh, a proud Hindu, for what he stands for, for bringing pride in his people, for bringing pride to being an Indian, for talking good about India on international platform. If, you know, I think we are so used to being uh, felt like we are good, no good losers, you know, for so many years and years and years that now suddenly when someone comes and tells us the opposite, we are not able to hajam nahi ora, you know, it, it's becoming indigestion for us. So uh, I think we need to first change our mindset and understand what he is trying to bring in. And uh, I think that's it. Sophiaji, thank you very much for sharing those thoughts. <coughs> this uh, whole notion of freedom of speech. I, I've been observing your Facebook wall and so on for quite some time. You rejected me as a friend, but I think that's because your limit, <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> your limit had been reached. But. Um, I felt it was intolerant, but then I thought, no, no, she has the freedom of expression to deny me that. Mm. But um, it's, it's reminded me that uh, we listen to many voices, and perhaps we have forgotten how to judge the voices that we're listening to a little bit, um, in the freedom of allowing everybody to do anything and everything they want. Maybe we need to recalibrate it a, a, a little. Um, as Abiji knows, uh, I was part of a an event held in the British Parliament and I was part of the organising team and it was called Tolerating the Intolerant. And it was an opportunity whereby we wanted to present to the British public and the British Parliament the history of Hindus and their persecution in the past, but also statistics about Hindus have been persecuted in India itself and also the neighbouring countries. So the event was very exciting and uh, very passionate and introduced uh, all sorts of dynamic and incendiary people into the space, but Parliament is created for conflicting views to be aired. And it wasn't until a couple of days later that objections were made that, in fact, we had been engaging in hate speech and that uh, what we had presented was Islamophobic. So a whole industry seemed to spring up out of nowhere and accused us merely because we were talking about the suffering of the Hindu community that in fact that itself was an Islamophobic event. And as Abeji knows, um, investigations were launched, there were statements made in the House, and all sorts of um, prominent people commented on it. But that was in England, one of the places, one of the sources of the BBC who were forever policing um, freedom of speech and freedom of expression in, in many countries. So just on the subject again of freedom of speech, we have uh, with us uh, Shefaliji, who again has, I feel, pushed a few boundaries and created her own channel to articulate news which perhaps wasn't being able to be expressed in the mainstream. So would you like to share your experiences with reference to the environment underneath the custodianship of Prime Minister Modi? I think uh, Francois hit the nail right on the head when he said that India is a country where the minority behaves like majority and the majority behaves like minority. That is the crux. The myth, the myth of Hindu intolerance is the greatest fairy tale told to the children of this country for the past 70 years. 
because there is no such thing it's a contradiction in terms there is no such thing as a hindu intolerance hindus are by nature tolerant and which is why everybody has been vilifying us everybody has been vilifying our culture they are people are telling us that rasam is communal that bharatnatyam is communal that sari is communal <laughs> tomorrow if modi ji starts talking about breathing people will say breathing is communal and we are going to stop breathing from today it's come to that and I'm, i'm not joking i have had a so called again liberal the who, someone who describes himself as a liberal he was saying that oh i am feeling so bad that i live in a city because modi ji talks so much about swachh bharat i want to go out and defecate in the open <laughs> it's it, that hatred is to this level and it's not just a hatred against mr modi as a person to them mr modi is signifies this other india which they do not belong to the bharat the real india and that is why all sorts of vilification is thrown at mr modi because he is the symbol of a battle that they lost i have said this before and i'll say it again that the so called liberal indian intellectual is neither liberal nor indian nor an intellectual and it is that person he, and they are they are everywhere they are in the media they are in the academia they are in the film world and they are the ones coming and giving us lectures about how not to be intolerant when they say we and by we i mean anybody who doesn't agree with their world view not necessarily anybody who is a supporter of mr modi but anybody who disagrees with them they label you intolerant because it suits their narrative so they create okay this is good dissent whatever they say is good dissent and what we say is bad dissent this is the dichotomy that has been systematically created over the last two years or the last four years particularly since 2014 you see on the ground in fact when this whole debate about intolerance and beef and was happening before some election and it always coincides with some election if you track it down every controversy whether it's award wapsy intolerance the caste violence bima koregaon whatever it is always been timed with some state elections or the other somebody should actually do an article on that or maybe it's already been done so when all this beef narrative was being propagated in the media i was going to a exhibition in uh, pune and uh, the artist there the calligraphy artist there was a muslim guy from uh, varanasi and he had actually carved out the entire gayatri mantra in arabic in hindi and in uh, uh, yeah in arabic and hindi on on a, on a plaque so i actually spoke to him as an elderly gentleman i said uh, there is so much of noise happening in the media are you feeling threatened and you have actually carved out the gayatri mantra he said no of course not in real life there is no intolerance <laughs> intolerance outrage is there on social media mainly because it is an un media because it is an image that they want to create and they want to they want you to fall for it he has spoken about kathua we all know what happened we all know that words like i am hindustan has been used by people who have probably never called this country hindustan in like a million <laughs> years they would call it india they wouldn't even call it bharat but why use hindustan in a placard it's very clear the message is very clear yes. that they are trying to demonize a whole religion they are trying to demonize a whole community they are trying to demonize all of us and the minute you say something and say don't vilify don't vilify me for okay whether the crime was committed also is debatable now because of the new truth coming out but even if there was a crime committed how am i responsible for a crime committed by a person if you keep telling me every single time there is an incident of islamic terror anywhere in the world that uh, terror has no religion blame that person but not the doctrine then how can you blame my whole religion for one crime done by somebody somewhere is this not hypocrisy but why is nobody questioning it and the, unfortunately as he very rightly pointed out the narrative is so strong and so entrenched that if it were not for social media voices like mine wouldn't ever reach people and you would have completely false narratives being peddled which are still being peddled but now at least we also have a voice and that way social media has really helped talking about mr modi i if i may uh, say so if there is one fault that mr modi can be accused of it's not intolerance it's extreme tolerance <laughs> so far let, let let's even let's let's talk about data 
the uh, underage child, underage man who was arrested in Bengal because he wrote something about a religious icon of some religion. He was arrested. Was he a Hind was, was was he from a minority? No, he wasn't. The person who was arrested in Bangalore recently for writing something on social media, the founder of Postcard. Why was he arrested? Whereas mainstream journalists who have been lying through their tweet, lying through their teeth on Twitter over and over again, some very, very famous names. There has been a journalist who faked a whole interview, a whole studio recorded interview with Sri Sri Ravi Shankar and she cut and pasted parts of it and she asked questions and she passed it off as a live interview. In any other country, she would have lost her job and been blacklisted for life. She's still peddling semen filled balloon stories. And even when it's proved wrong, she's not taken back her tweet or she's not apologized. And there is nothing happening to these people. And these are the people who day in and day out talk about intolerance and how India has become intolerant post 2014. It's ridiculous. It's a sickening, sickening narrative. Thank you. Shifaliji, thank you very much for that. And uh, thank you for your passion um, in making your point. Um, it's a, a strange situation that India has been on the receiving end of the most intolerant visitors for centuries. Um, and I was looking for examples of intolerance in other nations and civilizations who point to India. And I came across a few interesting ones. Most people here have probably never heard of the Criminal Tribes Act, which was introduced in India. Well, it was an extraordinary act of um, incredible generosity from the point of view of the people who introduced it. But um, in passing that law in Parliament, its uh, sponsor said, when we speak of professional criminals, we mean a tribe whose ancestors were criminals from time immemorial, who are themselves destined to be, by the usage of their communi community, to commit crime, and whose descendants will be offenders against the law until the whole tribe is exterminated. So this was the preamble that was used to pass the Criminal Tribes Act in 1871. By birth, criminal by birth, criminal by birth, yes. Um, but it wasn't uh, just the British who did this, and it wasn't all British. Um, in terms of the intolerance at the time, there was a, a gentleman here called Lord Auckland, and his niece was visiting him, and I came across her letter and she wrote back saying, I wonder how we are allowed to keep this country. Why don't they cut all our heads off and say nothing about it? So this was an indictment of a, an impartial visitor on what real intolerance actually is. And I, I don't think a subject of intolerance can be talked about without a reference to the emergency. Because that, if anything, was a, an act of intolerance, of incredible intolerance, and yet is conveniently bypassed. One thing I'd like to do is to open it up to the panel to explore each other's ideas and perhaps respond to something that their colleagues have said. Um, but before I do that, I think it's universally accepted that a fundamental human right is the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. And yet one continuous thread that I'm coming across now is that the majority community is being deemed to be guilty prior to being proven so. And that seems to be uh, an, an extremely intolerant position to have as the default position for either the media or for commentators. So on that note, if I can open it up to the panel. Francois, you wanted to respond and... Uh, yeah, I'll say something then. I have to leave because I'm flying to Paris tonight. Okay. Um, one of the most baffling you know, phenomena about intolerance is that do the people who accuse you of being intolerant are not ready to dialogue. I have seen with the French, uh, you know, in France, the, uh, the government subsidizes people who study India. So that is, these people are supposed to talk about India in a scientific and academic manner. There may be 10 of them. And they have been holding sway about what is thought and what is said about India in France for the last 50 years. Every time there's an election, they, you know, they write in the paper, they talk on TV. And they talk about caste, they talk about Hindu fundamentalism, they talk about in Hindu intolerance. You know. So the image that uh, France has of, of India is often fashioned by these people. Now, when I am their main competitor, you know, they hate me. You know, they, they, <laughs> they hate my guts. So, you know, I never met them and, you know, I'm maybe a decent guy. They hate my guts. They think I'm a very dangerous man. But whenever I offer to dialogue with them, they refuse. 
So that, that is, <laughs> you know, the people who accuse you of being intolerant are actually very intolerant because they refuse to have, you know, a, an open dialogue. You no, know? let let us dialogue together and let the, you know the public decide, you know, what they think. But they refuse that. And I have seen the same is true of Islamophobia. Now today, the biggest crime in the world is to be an Islamophobe. If you say anything against Islam, you know. Even if it is justified, you say, okay, you know, it is true that many of the terrorist acts in the world, you know, have been committed in the name of Islam in the last, you know, 30, 40 years, you know, and uh, today we pay the price. Every time we enter an airport, you have to go through so much security. Every time we go to a mall, you know. So, so if you say that, you're accused of a worse crime than those who actually commit the crimes, you know, mm -hmm. those who actually mm -hmm. kill people, innocent people, those who ram people, you know, they ram innocent people, Planes full of innocent people, you know, on towers full of innocent people. They're excused because oh, Palestine and Chechnya and Kashmir, maybe. They're excused. But if you say anything against Islam verbally, you know, I mean, you, okay, you may have a wrong opinion, but you're not killing anybody. You're not, you know, nothing. No harm is happening. <laughs> today, it's a worse crime. There is no worse crime today than being than speaking against Islam. So, I want to say, that, you know, that in talking about intolerance, you know, those who accuse you of being intolerant are the most intolerant people of all. You know, and the most absurd, because if they would think a little bit for a minute, you know, they would say, okay, you speak, you don't do any, you may be wrong, but you're not killing anybody. But these people who kill, they're killing innocent people. How, how can we defend them? How, how is it, you know, humanly possible to defend them? Yet, this is what's happening. Professor Ji, thank you so much for your participation. And I am aware that you're off to Paris today, so uh, we really do appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Thank you very much for that. Um, if anybody, please, if you could escort uh, Francois Ji. Thanks. Thank you. Bon voyage, even. Thank you. I've been wanting to use that for at least 14, <laughs> 14 years. <laughs> okay. So um, just continuing the theme, what uh, Francois raised there is the question, has India been so generous in the past with its resources and its understanding that there are communities and people who have become so spoiled by receiving that they are accustomed to ask and demand and we are accustomed to give and relinquish without judgment. Yeah. So, please. We have the Parsis in India who have been living in India for hundreds of years. It's a very small minority. Have you ever heard them say that they have been, they have been made to feel you know, lesser of citizens or complaining of the intolerance of the majority? Ever, even once? There are Jews who have been living in India for centuries. Have they complained of intolerance even once? So how is it that a population which is like 11 to 12 percent of the country, how is it that is the only sectional population that is complaining of intolerance <laughs> all the time? It, it doesn't even make sense uh, number-wise. I want to take up one issue which I heard in the previous panel. I heard a lot about how millennials don't have place for religion in their life or their problems, they are, they are focused on solving problems about poverty or whatever. I agree, there is a section of millennials who have, by God's grace, have got all the resources and they are totally focused about solving problems and all that. But does that make Paresh Mesta, who was 18 and who was killed for being a Hindu in Karnataka, in Mangalore, does it make him any less of a millennial? Does he, are his problems any lesser? Or are, do his problems not count at all? 18 year old lady, a Muslim lady, an 18-year-old girl who's been married at 16 and who's been divorced by her husband on a phone, talak, talak, talak. Is she not a millennial? Are her problems not real enough? So when you're talking about millennials, which millennials are we talking about? The RSS uh, Swayam Sevak, whose house gets, there, there was a guy whose father was killed 20 years ago and who was killed uh, recently, last year. He was killed in a very brutal way. Does, is he not a millennial? He was looking after his widowed mother, he was looking after his pregnant sister, he was, called, he was killed in front of them. Does he not have any rights? 
What are his problems? His problems are not about solving technology or getting internet. His problem is to just to save his own life and to make sure that his mother and his sister stay alive. But who are we to judge that this is not a millennial? That is one point I wanted to raise. <laughs> and I mean, this whole intolerance debate is so fake and so Absolutely. manufactured. Yes. And I... I find it really sad that increasingly there are young people falling for it. There's a 15-year-old boy who won a medal for India. Search his name and search Gurmehar Kaur's name and see how many articles are there about this, this boy who is a real achiever at the age of 15. And Gurmehar Kaur, whose only claim to fame is selling her father's reputation. See the dichotomy and understand the narrative. Thank you. Uh, like Vikas ji, if you'd yeah. like to. Um, actually, I was uh, having a DM conversation with a Congressy uh, a Muslim woman. And she uh, confessed that I really like uh, singing uh, Gadesh Vandana and all. So I was, please, please, but this is not the first uh, kind of uh, person I met. For example, Sophia also said that earlier she had a lot of anger for Mr. Modi. Even I was uh, actually shocked when a lot of news of about 2002 started coming up. Even uh, even though I'm a uh, hardcore swam sevak, the real culprit here is media and the left ecosystem. They will not let any Muslim or any Christian feel safe in India un uh, a under a Hindu majority. And I don't have any answer to it. And I don't know how to solve this problem. But uh, 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 we here agree that Hindus are more or less 99% of the times are very tolerant. But they will, uh, the left liberal media system will not let it means to be shown to them and they will inst instill fear for their TRPs and uh, for their propaganda. I don't know how to solve that issue. It's a long term issue. It's a very, very, if you go to any journalist wall, if, if for example, I, uh, I look into, uh, I, I, I was seeing a lot of articles of Lullantop, for example, if they were based on sports and a lot of issues, technology. I thought, let's see their political inclination also. If they are speaking about technology, what, they, what are their political inclination? If I search for their walls and I was actually seeing anti-Modi, anti-Brahmin uh, stations on their wall. So they, those media organizations are actually hiring or the whole journalism uh, uh, cult or say whole journalism breed is actually so left liberal. So I don't know, even if they are talking about technology, even if they are talking about anything else, their mindset is actually anti-India. Most of them. So uh, mm. uh, it's it's not that it is uh, actually the minorities of India which feel safe all uh, unsafe okay. all the time. It is they who make them feel insecure in India, and they are the main problem. Thank you for that remark. It's uh, a remark that is increasingly being voiced now, not just here, but also across yeah. the world. It's a common phrase that it's the extreme left who are creating the extreme right mm. because they're not allowing the dialogue to to be expressed. Well, we have 10 minutes, and before I uh, wrap up, what I'd like to do is to invite the audience to contribute and possibly <coughs> ask any questions. And uh, again, uh, please, if you could say your name, if you could ask your question and direct it to a member of the panel, please name them. Uh, I would ask, please, um, no statements, um, no um, manifestos. Please, short, succinct questions so we can squeeze in as many people as we possibly can. Uh, we do have microphones being... Uh, prepared or could we have some microphones please thank you before we take questions i just want to say one last please thing. feel yeah. free you have the floor for about <laughs> um, one and a half minutes yeah so <laughs> this just this last one thing the intolerance is not felt by indians it's not felt by any one of us in my opinion it is felt by the media and the anti india breaking forces they are the ones who are constantly feeding to us at ground level I'm very, very optimistic and I have interacted with a lot of people from my community and even elsewhere. We are living in absolute peace and harmony otherwise. So intolerance is just a state of mind. <laughs> okay. Like poverty, not, 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 not like poverty is a state of mind, but this is it. This is being fed to us only over the media and please let's not fall for this. There is really no intolerance and intolerance is not just, it's not like Muslims are trying to say that Hindus are intolerant. I don't think so. I, I really don't think that's happening. You go and ask any random Muslim, are you feeling intolerant really in the country? And I'm sure they will say, no, absolutely not. They're all living well. They're all doing well in their Thank own you. respective fields. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. 
So, um, do we have any questions in the audience? The, uh, the young gentleman... <laughs> Actually, a quick remark. I'm part of a Muslim Mahasena um, group, about 1,75,000 Muslims, and it's completely deriding everything that is Hindu. So I disagree with you over there. Okay. Welcome to be part of it. I engage with a lot of Muslims, tell them small things. Um, question to perhaps Shefali ji or uh, Vikas Pandey ji. Freeing Hindu temples from the government killing RTE, none of the Hindu causes have really been taken by this government in four years. There is a lot of despondency and anger among core Hindus. What is your, how do we at all go on defending Modi ji? I am not disagreeing with you and I share many of your concerns. But having said that, I am not despondent either. Because I, when I look back to how things were under the Congress, and when I look at pictures of uh, Sadhvi Pragya and uh, Colonel Purohit and uh, Asim Anand, and I realize that what a sinister conspiracy has been played against the Hindus. I don't have answers for your questions. I cannot tell you when RTE will be implemented or when Hindu temples will be free from temple control. But having said that, because of what the Congress has done to the Hindus, like this systematic uh, narrative of Hindu demonization was actually perpetuated by the Congress and uh, they use their uh, ecosystem in the media academia to sort of spread it. So because of that, I, am, I stand firmly with Mr. Modi. Stay calm, keep calm and trust Modi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you for that. Means as, as she said that a lot of things uh, which were I mean, we are Hindus are prosecuted. The idea of being Hindu was prosecuted under uh, under uh, Congress regime. They have faltered down. Uh, means now people are feeling proud to be Hindus. I see a lot of uh, uh, means Hindu uh, festivals. They have changed the vigor the, the way which they are celebrated. Even they are carrying tricolor all the time. So a lot of things have changed and uh, Hindus are feeling proud to be Hindus. So saying that uh, Modi ji hasn't done. About RTE and temple, I might have a, se a separate discussion with you, may have a different point of view. Temples, I agree, they should be free of clutches. At least it should be, uh, it should come under right to information. It should be shown on the board that they have actually, the funds coming out of the temples have been used for Hindu cause or not. At least that should be done and I agree with you on that part. RTE, I'm not very sure. Maybe uh, I have been through a Christian education, uh, I mean, uh, a missionary education. I have I, I, have, I have got a very brief idea about it. Maybe I will sit together and decide. But if you let even poors get into those kind of education, maybe they will be prone to conversion uh, later on. So because I have been 12 years in, in, into a missionary school, that is my apprehension. Otherwise, we, will ha we can have a separate discussion. Thank you. Um, yes, the young lady with her hand raised. The discussion over here is about uh, tolerance. And uh, my question is, it's a very tolerant panel, as I can see, you know. So there have been, it's, you know, to get questions out of the audience is very tough. But I have a question in mind, which is, uh, what is, do we want to continue being tolerant? And or do we want to now move to what is actually in Sanatan Dharam, which is about mutual respect? We've never been a tolerant nation, you know, be tolerating, you don't want to tolerate me and I don't want to tolerate you because that doesn't have a good connotation. So do we now need to up the ante and make the Hindus realize that you are not about tolerating anybody? We did not tolerate the conversions we do not want to tolerate the conversions which are happening now and change the dialogue and move to what we are. Wonderful. Is there anybody in particular you'd like to direct that like question to? to? Okay. Actually, you're right. Mutual respect is, is and should be the proper way to deal with it. So I agree with whatever you said. So I'm going to, I'm going to project that question to its logical conclusion a little bit further. And this may not be politically correct. But I was having a, a meeting with the Religious Education Council in the UK. 
and they're working on how to teach the next generation of children about religion. And everybody wants to talk about the equality of religion and how we have to respect all ideologies. And so I put it to them that that's an irrationality. When you teach children how to think, you teach them to compare, you teach them to look at option A, look at option B, judge them on their merits, and pick a path which is the best path. In that sort of a mind, how do you then tell it two contradictory statements and say what you must do is give both of them equality of understanding and of merit? It's an irrational thing. The human mind can't do that. And in our tradition, we never have done that. Ours has always been a fear fearless search for the reality, for satya, whatever it is. And we've always had the tradition of fearlessly discarding something that was deemed to be asat. And that's a fundamental part of our perspective. But the, the tolerance, and, uh, tolerance and intolerance aspect, there is a, another precedent. We have a story in one of our ancient shastra where a play was being performed and the devas were invited and the rakshasas were invited as well. And the rakshasas, the asuras, they felt unhappy that what was about to be said was going to be detrimental and denigrating to them. And so they decided to assault the stage and attack it. But the deities established the princ principle of free speech. They took up defensive positions around the stage and said, no matter what happens, this forum must always be protected. It's a forum in which anything can be expressed and then considered and maybe deconstructed, but the forum is sacred. And that's a fundamental part of our tradition. The difficulty we have is how do we reconcile with strength and confidence and say, actually, this is what we know is a wiser world and a wiser path, and we would welcome you to come here, but don't bring things that are relatively irrational without allowing us to scrutinize them. This, I feel, is, the, is going to be the challenge of India and Indians throughout the world, wherever we are, the, the approach and the, the respect for complete fearless engagement without being concerned about defending territories. So th that's something that the, the governments and the leading lights are going to have to encounter and, and perhaps we can contribute to their deliberations in, in, the, in this manner. Um, yes, is there anybody else who would like a, a quick question? Gee, and I have to say, the other young gentleman there, not wanting to discriminate against anybody. <laughs> Hello, sir. My name is Ayushman Kalita. Sir, my question is to both Saif Alimim and Vikas, sir. So when will the distortion of history be corrected? Sir, and second, sir, whenever, sir, the government has tried to take a core turn, it has always backtracked, sir, due to, the, uh, uh, due to the opposition by the media houses and the opposition parties. Ma'am, that has been very disheartening. For example, so, which one you are referring to? Sir? Uh, which uh, core thing you are referring to? Sir, sir, whether it be anything, sir. Sir, recently an article came, sir, where it was discussed that the nationalists will try to change history. Sir, and then uh, I, I read there. And then it was said that, no, we are not trying to change it. We will just try to be unbiased. No, uh, they are saying they, they will be unbiased means they are changing it, but they don't want to publicize it. When the NDA 1 came and uh, Murri Manwar Joshi was, uh, ji was HRD minister, actually a lot of things were being changed. But it was also being leaked to the media uh, also. That, is, that was causing a lot of problem and friction. Now things are being changed, but they are not coming out in media as such. So things are happening, but we don't know. But if there is no news, then it is good news. So th something is happening, but it's best that it doesn't come out. So one more thing, sir. So the uh, current HRD minister has been a disappointment. Uh, I'm <laughs> sorry, I, as moderator, I have to leap in and say thank you for that question. But no thank you. <laughs> okay, so we're approaching the end of this session. And um, if the panelists wish to, I'm going to allow one more minute each just to make a closing remark. And then we will close the session. So, um, Vikasji, if you have anything to summarize with, if not, that's okay. Yeah, while I have no solution to the problem of left narrative being so strong, but what I have fe uh, felt that uh, with the social media, as Ali Ji has said that we have got a lot of our voices, we, uh, they are hearing to our voices, people be hearing to our voices. And for example, if there was no social media, maybe Rahul Gandhi would have been our prime minister, but he's not. <laughs> That's why we have the power of social media. We should use it often. We should use it for constructive dialogue as much as possible. Uh, and in our own midst, uh, between us also, there are a lot of people who are not very logical when you're, they are using the arguments. Sometimes they lose their temper and uh, generalize things based on like religion. All Muslims are bad or things like that. We have to make sure that they understand things. 
they understand things that a dialogue is necessary it if two people are talking to each other it doesn't mean that they are only talking to each other there are thousands of people who are seeing what that dialogue concludes to that is why uh, that is why it is uh, we as such in present in this room and listening to this uh, dialogue as such should become a moderator as uh, as well as mentor to those people and make sure that they talk sense thank you vikas ji shifa ji in conclusion i think i've talked a lot <laughs> not all of it is politically correct so really i agree with him we all need to stay united and we need to speak up and we need to be assertive without being overtly offensive or aggressive language is very important which doesn't mean that we take everything that is thrown at us lying around we have to uh, oppose we have to make our points but let us be logical and let's be coherent about it and keep calm and trust modi <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think I've also said enough. This is just last uh, okay. request to everybody. Let's behave civilized. When we are, when we are on social media, I have noticed a lot of thing people behave like they are talking to a, a computer or you know to their mobile. <laughs> they don't understand that the co uh, the comment that they are sending towards is also another person. we lot of co communication the way it happens it happens as if uh, you know it, there's a total disregard there's a total disrespect and uh, if at all there is this is that, that's what amounts to intolerance so let us all keep patience and maintain civilized behavior and uh, uh, one thing that we should always remember is that india has always been tolerant ever since and uh, intolerance does not exist certainly not in the last 4 years suddenly because a country is made up of people leaders come and go modi ji has been here for the last 4 years he have one more year we don't know after that what's going to happen but then people will remain and if people were tolerant before they couldn't have been suddenly intolerant in the last 4 years just because the government change so please use your rational use your common sense use logic and then conclude for yourself what you think is the right thing and don't fall for propagandas that's all thank you very much Thank you for that statement. Wonderful. So, in uh, conclusion, this session has been about: uh, Is India becoming more tolerant? Uh, sorry, more intolerant and less tolerant under the custodianship of uh, Prime Minister Modi ji. I think we, from across the water, we have a, a little bit of a perspective on this. And one thing we have seen is that India's capital, India's respect throughout the world, in the last four years, has completely transformed. the world leaders are recognizing the indian civilization as an incredibly valuable asset to the global human race as well as the uh, ecological aspects of it and so this um, the last the thoughts that i would have is to perhaps always consider that the person who is pointing the finger of intolerance um, may not be without an agenda uh, there are vested interests and if every single but the every single indian in any way shape or form just considers the second thought who is it who's articulating it do they have an agenda do i need to accept this as being fact and i think if everybody starts to do that the myth of indian intolerance will actually evaporate very very fast the last thing i would have is you have in front of you individuals who have actually made a contribution themselves they didn't look to um become united or anything like that they looked and thought well what can i do about it and i have seen this throughout the world that there are people who are actually making that choice and making that difference and again if every indian lives up to the quality and the blessings of their ancestors we can transform much of what uh, the problems seem to be at this time they will disappear and evaporate in front of our eyes so i'd like to thank the audience as well for participating and for turning up on such a hot day here namaste We hope you enjoyed this Chitti Media content. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit cittti.net. Dhanyawad. Namaskar.